Today we are going to return to the steady state, return of the steady state. And this uh, term comes from, uh, it's a ast astronomy term. Astronomer Fred Hoyle was a proponent of a theory of creation known as the steady state model. <clears throat> and it's interesting that he favored this theory over the Big Bang though he was actually responsible for naming it, the Big Bang, in a BBC radio interview. His use of the phrase, however, was intended as ridicule. I guess he was being interviewed uh, talking about the steady state uh, model, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. But he was making fun of the Big Bang. It had just come out when he was being interviewed, and uh, he did not like the idea. The steady state model is based on the idea that the universe is expanding all the time. This, we're not in a uh, static universe, we're in a one that's expanding. So Fred Hoyle embraced that idea. But the steady state means that for the expansion that occurs, new matter is being created and old matter is being dissolved. And it's a constant balance, which is why it's the steady state. And that was uh, embraced by a lot of people, including Einstein, uh, who also fought the whole idea of the Big Bang for a long time, but finally gave in. And I have argued with it myself, but I'm not a physicist and I have no credentials whatsoever. So I have not liked it because, the Big Bang, because it's based on the belief that the universe began as a particle of matter, based on a material-based uh, concept. The steady state theory is based on the idea that the universe never had a beginning. And I like that. And I got to thinking about that, that um, that's very much like the soul. It describes the soul. And the Big Bang describes our thought processes. So I'm going to kind of pick up on both of these ideas today and try to blend them together. Not from a cosmological point of view, by any means, but from a metaphysical point of view. Because they do actually fit. And we can uh, see, I think the Big Bang people are describing the beginning of the material universe. And there is, in our own personal life, a beginning of a material universe. And it does begin with a Big Bang. But there's also the steady state that never changes. It's always the same, and that's the soul. So we're going to talk about those two ideas from a little bit different perspective. But I actually quoted uh, Fred Hoyle. I didn't even really know who he was in the book, uh, my book, a Practical Guide to Meditation and Prayer, which I wrote back in 1990. But there he said, our everyday experience, even down to the smallest details, seems to be so closely integrated to the grand scale features of the universe that it is well nigh impossible to contemplate the two as being separated. And as I think back, my terminology today would be that he's basing that on the uh, paradigm of oneness, that we're not separate from this universe. And that's what I was talking about way back in, the, in my prayer book. He was talking about oneness. But I like the scientist that does this, you know, that goes around, skirts, skirts the uh, religious terminology, but still comes up pretty much with the same thing we're talking about, you know, when we talk about oneness. Because I would I totally agree with what he wrote back then, and uh, I obviously did because I put it in my book. But the uh, steady state and the Big Bang, think of the soul as the steady state, and the Big Bang as the explosion of thought and emotion that grows up around a challenging situation. See, your, your negative states of mind that pop up when you have a problem, they begin very much like they describe the Big Bang as a particle, a single thought, a little bit, a little tiny idea. Uh, we may hear something said or uh, whatever, some information comes to us that we don't fully, uh, you know, develop that, but we think about it. And our emotion gets involved, and pretty soon the thing explodes into this universe of, I've got a problem. 
and the problem is probably you or it's somebody like you or it's whatever's going on and I start living in this problem living in this uh, this new universe that has exploded within me and what I have done in doing that is I have left my steady state I have left my spiritual center and have became become engaged in the thought and emotion process that uh, this event triggered and it can be the simplest thing that uh, that triggers it and yet we do it we're so used to doing it that we don't even notice that we've just experienced the big bang you know we've ex we've accepted the particle the the seed idea that will develop into a stream of thought and emotion that we call a bad experience but the soul knows nothing of this we have taken our attention away from the steady state of the soul and moved it into the big bang these are legitimate metaphors it dawned on me that we can combine these two ideas as they both represent principles that can help us understand the metaphysics of prayer and the manifestation process in general I almost entitled this the metaphysics of prayer because it's it's how prayer works and it's if we understand what we're doing with our mind with our thought and emotion in this big bang of uh, experience that we're having we can understand how prayer works you know we're not trying to get God to change the world we're trying to change the big bang we're trying to get that under control we're trying to get that redirected our prayer really is directed to the processes of our own consciousness not to God because God is in the steady state if you say God I need more peace God will just say well I I'm giving you as much peace as I possibly can because I'm everywhere and you're not you're not here you're not in the peace that I'm giving so I can't do much about that you know I can just kind of stand by and watch <laughs> you go through your big bang and go through this uh, roller coaster ride what's also interesting is Jesus said exactly the same thing in his parable of the rock and the sand in his parable of the house built on rock and one built on sand Jesus referred to mental conditions one steady as a rock the other shifting and unstable as sand the soul is the steady unchanging rock our reaction to life's events can quickly turn into an emotional roller coaster as shifting and as unsteady as sand and you see that's what we um, when you're in that state of mind where you're in kind of a frenzy over a problem that you're having you know we refer to that as like an emotional roller coaster ride because it shifts it's a shifting thing and we're trying to resolve it all the time so we can find peace we're trying to get back to the steady state but we're doing it by building a house on sand we want that house to stand and it's not going to stand and that's what we need to know you know we're not praying for the house to survive on the sand we want to get off the sand we want to get back on the rock back into that steady state and that's really what prayer is it's moving from one state of awareness to another the the one state of awareness is is the shifting sand the changing thing that we're trying to if I can just get this thing resolved I'll be peaceful I'll be happy and of course we do and then we've got another house on another uh, beach you know that uh, is having problems it just it's a never-ending thing and we're all aware of that and we think well it must be because I'm not evolved enough I'm not uh, you know I don't know enough about spiritual stuff so I need to study harder I need to learn more but that's not true you need to remember more you know that's that's what we come down to we need to remember more we need to recover what we already own what we already have our house is already on the rock but we keep insisting on trying out that sand because it's you know it's a pretty nice piece of real estate when things are steady but it won't stay steady very long so our steady state and Big Bang let's think of our soul as in a perpetual steady state of power and peace our perceptual response to negative people and conditions 
is like a big bang of emotion that explodes into the kinds of experiences that keep us awake at night. Have you ever had somebody say something to you that was a little off color, a little, you weren't quite sure, but didn't think a lot about it until later? And then the more you think about it, the more you, you're sure that they meant <laughs> this or that. And then the more you think about it, you think about all the things that you remember they've done, you know, and how they're just not worth worrying about, but you're worried about them. And it's, it explodes into this thing that it can become an issue. And it's difficult to deal with that once it gets out of the, uh, just the, and the, when the, and maybe the person was saying something that was degrading to you or uh, was attacking or whatever, maybe they were. But here's what we have to think about. Where does that happen? It came out of their mouth, but where does it actually live? Where do those words live? Where does the experience we're having as the result of it, where does that actually live? And we have to bring, our, if we're going to get some kind of handle on this, we have to accept that it's going on inside of us. The Big Bang is happening in our own consciousness. And it started out as something small, and it's not just something somebody says, although I'm going to share a story with you that <laughs> happened to me this week that is kind of funny, that uh, illustrates it perfectly. It gave me perfect opportunity to practice what I brought up last week. So I talked about vaporizing the people and conditions that disturb us. And of course, this refers to mental and emotional exercise. We hold a picture of the disturbing person or circumstance, and we imagine love dissolving it. So did any of you have a chance to use that technique this week or want to use it? If uh, It's kind of an abstract idea, but I, have, I, met, I know a couple of people that could help you with this. Uh, if you want to call them, I'll include the contact information in the uh, in the notes. But uh, we've got people that know how to <coughs> send out rays of love that will dissolve anything. And you can be like that, too. You can get to that point. So the first step is to, it's denial, release, or vaporize. And I kind of like the vaporize thing best. Traditionally, this is called denial or release, but vaporizing the person or condition may be a little more gratifying. <laughs> On the screen of our imagination, we see the image of the problem area dissolve into nothingness. Now, I had a, uh, I went out in the, my garage on, on the way over here and noticed that the back left tire was flat. And uh, it wasn't all the way flat, it had a nail in it. I went, over, went out and looked at it and found this shiny nail. And um, I didn't have a way to get it over to the, the tire place because we're not having two drivers right at the moment. So I ended up taking the tire off the car. I haven't changed the tire in years. I'm not like uh, Kenny Ruth when she has a nail in her tire. She just goes and buys another car. So. <laughs> I didn't do that. I thought about calling Kenny Ruth, but uh, so I ended up taking the tire off and taking it over just to have him put a plug in the hole. You know, it's a very simple fix. I've done that myself. You stick a glued piece of rubber stuff in there that they make for that, and it patches the hole. You don't even have to take the tire off. But if the hole is close enough to the edge, your tire will be ruined, and I wasn't quite sure if we had a ruined tire or not. Well, I take it over there, and this guy is trying to help me. He's looking at looking at the tire and all, and well, I don't know if it's ruined or not. We'll let you know. And this uh, girl came over, the woman came, a young woman came over, and uh, she didn't look at anything. She just asked a little bit of information. The guy was having trouble with the computer. She was helping him with that. She said, well, he's going to have to buy five tires because she looked at the model of the tire and said, we don't make that one anymore, obviously. And uh, so we can't just replace one. You know, we're going to have to replace them all. If we do, if your spare is old enough, it's no good. We can't legally, you know, change them out. And do a It's just this, uh, my, I was getting my uh, vaporizing me mechanism up and running <laughs> because all, all I was hearing was a line, you know, from the tire company. And so 
<clears throat> but then I stopped everything and I said, but the best case scenario is you just stuck, stick a plug in the hole, right? And they both agreed that was that would could happen. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I went home and I came back when they called and said it was ready and uh, it was out in the shop and I was in talking and I got the girl again. I got to this woman and uh, she, I, I had in my mind, she was going to tell me that tire was ruined and you know, it's gonna be five tires. So she goes out in the shop and she's out there a long time and she's looking at the tire and she's kind of doing something to it. Well, she ended up putting water on it with the soap, soap, you know, to see if the hole was leaking. I didn't know what she was doing. But she rolls the tire in and while she's out there doing that, I'm thinking, you know, she's gonna find something wrong, you know, and but then I thought, no, I'm gonna vaporize her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started vaporizing her. And I was standing there looking through the glass out as she was out in the shop and I vaporized that person that was out to get my money. You know, I just I mean it was that was all in my head. So she comes and I successfully did it because I felt like everything's all right you know it's fine even if I have to buy five tires not the end of the world I just don't want to do it so she comes in she rolls the tire in she says well it's all done she's just very cheerful and you know like uh, somebody I could be friends with you know and I said okay what do I owe you and she says nothing she even offered to roll it out and put it in my car in the back of the car and I was raised in a uh, culture that doesn't allow men to let women roll tires out into the car. So <laughs> I said, that's okay. <laughs> but that's a simple thing. And again, it's like the story I shared a couple of weeks ago about my sprinkler wasn't working. I said, you know, infinite intelligence and it started raining. Uh, I don't see any of this as magic. What changed while I was in the waiting room, waiting for the woman to come in with my tire, what changed was me. It was like I was able to let that whole scenario go and say, it's okay. No matter what, it's okay. You know, I'm not going to resist this. I'm not going to make something out of this. I prevented a big bang. And in other words, I got back to my steady state. There, I was close, you know, got close to that big bang where, um, and if she had come back with other information, I might have had the big bang. I don't know. <laughs> but that's, that's the kind of place I'm talking about, the kind of place that it, uh, where we are most of the time. These are the kinds of things that set us off. Because if I would have had to buy five tires, you know, I would have probably gone home and thought about that quite a while and thought about why I didn't really want to do that and how I was going to get the car back over there and all kinds of things. But none of that happened. So I didn't have to go through that big bang and have this universe explode out with, you know, a whole scenario of ideas. Uh, that had nothing to do with reality. So what changed is me. And when we talk about prayer, what does prayer change? Does it change the way God behaves? Does it change that steady state? Or does it change us? Does it get us back to that steady state? And that's what we want. And ultimately, even if there, you've got to buy five tires and you are able to get into that steady state, even when that happens, that's when you're really making progress. Usually what, where I'm at at this stage of my life is uh, give me five, 10 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, I can, I'll get there, but uh, not usually immediately. That's just how we're trained, that's our culture, to respond, to react, to have the big bang. You know, we're trained to think that's the way it's done. So the first step is uh, denial or release. And that idea of vaporization, you know, it's, if we think of it in a positive way, it's, uh, it's actually very easy to do it and do it in a positive way where you're not thinking you're doing harm to somebody because you're not. All you're doing, you're vaporizing your own mental and emotional attitude. That's what's being vaporized. But it looks like them. It looks like that person. And that's why it's so real to us because it has a face. It's mental and emotional energy with a face. That's what it comes down to. And so we think the face is the reality, but it's the mental, emotional energy. That's what affects us. That's what takes us down to a different level. So we vaporize that first. We release that. We deny it. And by denying, we're saying, 
I'm not going to let you reside in my consciousness. I'm not going to let you be here. Uh, but I like vaporization better. So it's more, has a more um, modern feel to it now. Though the power of unconditional, or through the power of unconditional love, we allow ourselves to feel the mental and emotional freedom and satisfaction of releasing the negative energy, uh, negative imagery, into the nothingness from which it came. See, that's, you can, you can be in a steady state, you can be in that state of peace or centeredness, and something pops up, it's mental, emotional energy, where does it come from? You know, it doesn't drop out of the sky. It, we generate it ourselves. It's a choice that we make. And so to be conscious of that, we can dissolve it back into that state of, uh, that steady state from which it came. When we forgive ourselves for going down that path in the first place, we then forgive ourselves for going down that path in the first place. We also remind ourselves that we will not confront the person or condition unless and until we're given clear guidance to do so. The toothpaste is out of the tube and we're not going to try to put it back in. We're going to vaporize it. So in a sense, that's what we do. Uh, if we confront somebody or confront a condition before we find peace in ourselves, we're likely to make it worse. And so we you try to put the toothpaste back in the tube, you know, in, in that sense, and we're not going to do that. It's happened, so we've got to deal with ourselves. And that's, uh, again, we're just not in the habit of doing that. We were not trained growing up to do that. If somebody does something to you, they did it. You know, it's my reaction has nothing to do with it. I'm reacting like any normal person would. I'm justified. I asked 50 friends about it, and they all say I would do the same thing. <laughs> so does that make it right? Uh, if we're looking for, for a peaceful experience, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter how many agreements you get from other people. That has nothing to do with your state of experience. So that's what we're watching. So self-forgiveness, okay, I blew up, um, and I'm not going to condemn myself for that. But do I confront the person? Sometimes you do. Sometimes it's necessary. Another experience I had was uh, our tax issue. It finally came up, and it came to a head. And the fact is, we did owe the tax. And what happened is we um, paid, it was paid in the sale of the property. It was offset. In other words, the, the amount was deducted when we bought the property with the understanding that when it came up, we would give it back, you know, to the tax people. Well, I had totally forgotten that. So I thought a lot of evil things about the tax people, you know, during that time. And I thought, they just don't know what they're, well, they kind of do know what they're talking about. So I called them up and I said, I figured out the problem. You know, it's, it's on our end and we apologize for it. Well, it's no problem. You just pay the fine and we'll be fine, you know. <laughs> so we do. So it's all clear now. But <clears throat> there are times you confront in uh, that kind of way where what I was doing is clearing my negative reaction by saying, uh, now we understand it, and it was not your problem, it was ours. So there's something that feels pretty good about that. Before that, before I understood what was uh, going to, how it was, what was really going on, is I was prepared to call our attorney and have them settle it. And that would have been a really dumb thing to do without having settled the thing in myself first. So you can do that and go down that route and do it in a way that makes the problem a lot worse. Or you can let it play out and you know figure out what's really going on until you find your center of peace. And the way I found that was to call our realtor. realtor. And um, I called him several weeks ago. He didn't return my call. I called him again, and he, told, he reminded me of the, the sale, what happened. There was so much going on at that time that I, I barely could remember my own name, let alone all the stuff that we agreed to do. So... In a way, I'm trying to get myself off that hook, but uh, it was our our error, you know, our mistake. So there's times when you do confront, and but you you want to be centered. You don't want to be angry, you know, when you confront somebody over something because you'll lose it and you'll make it worse. So that can all be based on a lie. 
You know, that whole reaction, you can blow something up into something that's unrecognizable, has nothing to do with the actual event, the actual reality of the whole thing. So when the toothpaste is out of the tube, just make sure if the, if the uh, opportunity comes up for you to resolve it with another person or not, you know, whatever, whatever you're moved to do, just do it out of a state of peace rather than out of a state of anger because that just never plays out well. So our return to our steady state, we know we're successful when we can hold the situation in our mind and feel good that the proper resolution is forthcoming. When we attain this stabilizing condition of mind, we have returned to the steady state. So I returned to the steady state when I was watching the woman examine my tire. Uh, I actually had the experience of peace. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay. And um, it's a, that's a silly example, but it's the most common, most common kind of thing that we get ourselves in. Because we can really get ourselves, go down, you know, that rabbit hole pretty fast and get into a pretty negative state of mind. But we want to return to our steady state. All right? Pretty simple, right? Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.